Good afternoon and welcome. My name is David Williams. I'm the president of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. I want to thank you for coming to our panel briefing today, Independence Day 2.0, Freedom from Our Outdated Tax Code. Now, the original title of this panel was Independence Day 2.0, Tax Reform Resurgence. I saw the reviews of the movie, and I said, no, we really should change the name. We want this to be a bipartisan discussion on tax reform, and that's really important to us because uh, every issue that I've dealt with, I've been in D.C. for 23 years, every issue that I've dealt with that we've had success, it's been on a bipartisan uh, uh, means. We're honored to be joined by two members of Congress. We have uh, who's coming is uh, Chairman Kevin Brady, of uh, Chairman of House Ways and Means. We have Representative uh, Bill Flores from Texas here to make a special introduction for Rebecca. And we have some really exciting panelists. We're going to have Pete Sepp, President of the National Taxpayers Union, and Simon Rosenberg with the New Democrat Network. So after we hear from the members of Congress, we'll have that panel discussion. Now, I could st uh, stand up here for probably hours and talk to you about tax reform, but I'm not going to do that. I want to show you a video. We have been uh, doing these uh, man on the street interviews for a few years now where we go to the streets of D.C. We talk to people what they think about tax reform, uh, what they want to see changed in taxes. And we do this and we don't ask people their political affiliation. We just go and we do man on the street. Let's uh, go ahead and show that video. Last time we had tax reform, let's say it was like 98? In the 90s. I was just thinking sometime after the Depression, because that seems like it's that antiquated. 2000. 2008. 1986. It's been 30 years. 1986. That's Are okay. Serious? 19 no. I think my world has just been crushed. <laughs> what would you say is most frustrating about April 15th? Um, it is a huge amount of paperwork. Yeah, I'm actually a small business owner, so for me it's like figuring out all the various expenses and what you can deduct and what's not, and it starts to get pretty complicated, like figuring all that out. I think just gathering all the paperwork is frustrating. It's tough to figure out what you owe. Is it the complexity of the code? Is it all the paperwork you have to do? Is it the time you have to spend doing it? What do you think? The taxes you have to pay. So every year when we do this video, I'm reminded of two things. First, how difficult it is to get people to stop talking about how frustrated they are with their taxes. Now, we do get a handful of people that don't want to talk to us because they're afraid the IRS is going to see the video, and they don't want to be targeted by the IRS. But I'm also reminded just how much of a bipartisan issue this really is, because we didn't ask these people what their political affiliation was. We just stop people on the street. This is uh, done in Chinatown, so we got a good mix of uh, tourists and locals. And we didn't ask political affiliation, so we have no idea if these people are Republicans, Democrats, Independents. And we hear the same thing over and over again. The tax code is complicated. Now, I don't want to steal Chairman Brady's thunder and talk too much about the blueprint for tax reform that was released uh, a couple Fridays ago. But I do want to mention one aspect of it. I think it's a critical aspect and that's the corporate tax rate. Currently, the United States has the highest corporate tax rate in the world at 40%. To put that in perspective, China's tax rate, corporate tax rate, is 26%. Canada has a 25% corporate tax rate. So a couple years ago, when we saw Burger King being bought by uh, Tim Hortons, this was because of our uh, excessive corporate tax rate. So we're hoping that as part of the plan, the plan is a 20% corporate tax rate, we can see that corporate tax rate lowered and bring business back to the United States. Now, it's obviously not just about corporate taxes, it's about individual taxes. It's about collapsing brackets, bringing down tax rates, and making this a fairer, simpler tax code for everybody. It's not just for Republicans, not just for Democrats, it's for everybody. So we're hoping that's what the blueprint accomplishes, it, that it completely revamps the tax code. And as you heard, the last time this happened was 1986. The last time we had comprehensive tax reform was 1986. That's 30 years ago. I'm assuming some people in this room weren't even around 30 years ago. 
I was, and my hairline was a lot different 30 years ago. But, but seriously, it's time to address this head on, and it's time to address it head on in a bipartisan matter. Getting back to uh, the corporate tax rate. In 2012, President Obama, he talked about this, that he wanted to lower the corporate tax rate. That's why I think we have hope here, that we can work with, uh, Republicans and Democrats can work together. And also every year we hand out these little stress balls to people. And remember, this is right before tax day. So it comes in very handy as they're trying to figure out what to do with their taxes. As I mentioned, we have a wonderful panel. Um, and hopefully the chairman will show up soon so we can get, uh, get to our panel. But um, <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, well, let's uh, get right into this. Um, we have a special guest, uh, Representative Bill Flores uh, from Texas. A lot of Texans here today. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm an Eagles fan, so I'm always a little bit uncomfortable with all these Texans in, in one room. But uh, uh, Representative Flores is, is from Texas and is the uh, chairman of the Republican Study Committee and really appreciate all the work that he's, uh, he's doing. And he's going to introduce our first panelist, who is a Rebecca Bainick, who runs Neutral Posture. She is the CEO and chairman. That's right, not chairperson, not chairwoman, chairman of uh, Neutral Posture. Representative Flores. Well, good morning, everybody. Or actually, it's good afternoon now. So, uh, David, thank you for uh, putting this uh, this on. It's going to be very helpful for uh, many of us. Uh, uh, taxes are one of the most frustrating thing that things that we as Americans have to deal with, and so I think this discussion is uh, is uh, perfectly appropriate. We all know the tax code is more than seventy four thousand pages long. It's overly complicated. It's nearly impossible to navigate. Last month, the House Republicans, led by Ways and Means Chairman Brady, laid out the groundwork for a new tax code that is flatter, fairer, and simpler. It proposes a uh, tax system stro so straightforward that uh, American families will be able to file their taxes on a postcard as well. And uh, on a, from a business standpoint, it encourages investment and innovation for small business. It makes us competitive internationally again, as you heard David talk about before. As the chair of the largest caucus in Congress, I was pleased that several of the recommendations that my group made, the Republican Study Committee, were incorporated into the task force draft. So that was exceptionally helpful uh, also. According to the Tax Foundation's taxes and gross, uh, growth model, this plan would significantly raise GDP and add over one million American jobs. Our tax code is broken. It's time for a better way for tax reform. It's also time to replace the IRS with a tax collection agency that is honest and trustworthy. One of the, today's panelists for this bipartisan discussion on why America needs comprehensive tax reform is a constituent from the 17th Congressional District of Texas, which I'm honored to represent. It's an honor to introduce Rebecca Boehning from College Station, Texas, home of the Fighting Texas Aggies. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca serves as the chairman and CEO of Neutral Posture, Inc. She has over 27 years of experience in research, development, design, and the manufacturing of ergonomic uh, seating. She has grown uh, Neutral Posture into an international company with numerous award-winning patented products. Rebecca and her mother led Neutral Posture, Inc. from a startup company to becoming a publicly held company in just nine years. In 1997, Neutral Posture completed an initial public offering, becoming the first and only certified woman-owned business to be traded on the NASDAQ. In 2006, Rebecca was appointed to serve on the National Women's Business Council, which serves as advisors to, president, to the President, to Congress, and to the U.S. Small Business Association. Rebecca has served on uh, numerous boards and has held high-ranking positions, such as President of the uh, Business and Institutional Furniture Manufacturers Association, member of the Board of Directors for the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, member of the Board of Directors of the Institute for the Economic Empowerment of Women, and as a national founding partner of Women Impacting Public Policy. I am pleased to introduce my friend, Rebecca Badig, and I know she has much to add to this important discussion. And uh, Rebecca, I'm going to have some of my colleagues here to take notes. I've got to leave to go to lunch with the speaker. I think he's got to tell me something. So anyway, <laughs> or i got to tell him something. Anyway, without further ado, Rebecca Badig. So thank you all. Actually, I'm not going to go next. 
Okay. Oh, I was just introducing. Okay. I'm going to call an audible here. Um, I would like to introduce um, our first uh, speaker of the day, Representative Kevin Brady, who uh, represents the 8th District in Texas. As many of you know, he is the uh, chairman of House Ways and Means. And as part of Paul Ryan's A Better Way, um, they included tax reform, a blueprint for tax reform. And I was looking at Chairman Brady's um, bio, and one thing that jumped out at me, uh, I've been in D.C. for a very long time and have followed really what every member of Congress does when it comes to tax reform and taxpayers. And Chairman Brady has done some amazing work in Washington, D.C., but I think the most impressive work that he's done has been outside of D.C. with working with different chambers of commerce. And I, I mention that because he had a first-hand look at what the tax code does to businesses, how it treats businesses, how complicated it is. So I, I think that's why he's uh, the perfect person to put this tax reform package together because he's seen both sides of it. Obviously, he's been in Congress for a number of years. Not too many, but a number. And uh, he's also seen uh, the private sector and what the private sector is dealing with. So I'm not going to talk too much about his plan since it is his plan. And I'm hoping he can give us a little more details of what he thinks the important parts of it are and how we can move forward in a bipartisan manner to get some of these uh, things accomplished. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hold your applause. Yeah, I'm kidding. Hey, Rebecca. It's good to see you. First, thanks, David, thanks to you and the Alliance for building the momentum uh, for pro-growth tax reform. And thanks for the support of the uh, Built for Growth blueprint that was released uh, last week. Again, uh, tremendous leadership by our speaker, Paul Ryan laying out what we stand for and how we can change the direction of this country and, and pro-growth tax reform is key to that. And Rebecca, my former constituent, uh, glad to see you're doing well. Thanks for the op-ed in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram making the case for why we need to, why we can't li live with the broken, complex, unfair tax code we have today. So thank you, welcome you. We gotta spread the word. Um, let me um, give you um, sort of where we're going and why. Uh, and again, this is all a key part of Speaker Ryan's Better Way agenda, which tax reform uh, in some ways is sort of the crown jewel of that. Um, we don't, look, we don't have to settle for a second-rate economy where your paychecks are flat for years and years and years, where qualified people can't find full-time work, where it just seems like America stalled out, our foreign competitors seem to grow stronger and we go weaker, weaker. We don't have to settle for that. And a big reason for all that is we have this costly, complex tax code. And so we have two goals uh, in this blueprint. One, we want a tax code built for growth, built for the growth of your salaries, uh, built for the growth of local businesses and jobs, and built for the growth of the U.S. economy. And we want to leapfrog America from dead last among our global competitors into the lead pack of most pro-jobs tax codes on the planet and keep us there going forward. So that's what's driving us through this whole blueprint. And this blueprint, by the way, uh, encompasses ideas from more than 50 Republican members uh, of the House. The work that, uh, uh, that Bill Flores did as chairman of RSC, you're seeing a number of those provisions in this blueprint. The advice we've gotten from Richard Hanna, from his manufacturing background and how we create jobs there are all incorporated in this blueprint. So it really is a consensus uh, pro-growth approach. So build for growth, leapfrog other countries. So we really focus on three things. We go all in for growth on jobs, go all in for simplicity for families, and then we hold the IRS accountable with a new 21st century tax collector. So let's begin with the first one. Going all in on growth means that uh, we, we propose uh, the lowest tax rates on businesses in modern history. Uh, lowering the corporate rate to 20 percent, that's the lowest in American history. Uh, taking pass-throughs, that, that would be the moms and pops perhaps, those partnerships, those companies not structured as a C corporation, and dramatically lowering their rates as well uh, to the lowest rate since the Great Depression, 25 percent. We do that for the first time in history we separate the income from business and the income from individuals. In the past, you couldn't tell the difference between Bill Gates and Bill Electrician. 
So Bill the Electrician paid higher tax rates as a business. So we separate that for the first time so we can lower those rates, drive job growth uh, in the local com community. For the first time, uh, we stopped taxing companies in America here and abroad and taxing them to bring their profits home to the U.S. So we end that. We tax them here in the U.S. And when they compete and win around the world and want to bring those profits home to reinvest in jobs and manufacturing and research here in America, the tax rate for them to do that is zero. Zero. So we don't just lower the tax gate back in America. We obliterate it. And that's going to create jobs. Thirdly, uh, we're going to stop taxing American exports. We are really the only modern uh, country that, that does this. And so we're going to match what our foreign competitors do. And, and the purpose here, twofold. One, when something is stamped proudly made in America, whether it's a manufactured good or intellectual property, under today's tax code around the world, they're at a disadvantage here at home, they're at a disadvantage overseas, so we end that, so that you can manufacture here and sell around the world. And that also el eliminates any incentive for companies to move their manufacturing headquarters or jobs overseas. Uh, and it simplifies the international tax code going well. First time we've done that. And then finally, for businesses as well, we know the missing ingredient in the current recovery, it's not consumer spending, it's not government spending, those all recovered right away, it's business investment. When businesses invest in buildings, equipment, software, technology to be more productive, jobs along Main Street in Rebecca's company grows. We know that from the last half century. So for the first time in history, we allow unlimited business investment, period. That means businesses write it off the year they buy it, and they carry forward that in the future. That may be the single most pro-growth part of this tax reform. So you take all of that, and we've now leapfrogged from that dead last into that lead pack. That's critical for growth. And for businesses, not only do we eliminate the alternative minimum tax, that's that second tax that catches businesses and families, but for the first time since it was created in 1916, we end the death tax. So family-owned farms and businesses are able to pass that down to the next generation, also extremely pro-growth. So all in for growth on the business side. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, all in for simplicity on the family side. You know, for years, really decades, people have said to Washington, why can't we have a tax code so fair and simple and understandable it could fit on a postcard? And for years, people have sort of dismissed that. But that's exactly what we're proposing. A code so simple and fair, it could literally fit on a postcard, 14 lines. And so the way we do this is, one, we simplify those seven brackets. We consolidate them down to three. We lower the tax rates at every level. So no longer will the top rate be effectively 44.6%. It will be 33. So 12%, 25%, and 33% creates um, tax relief at every income level. We know that when families save and invest, we know that also grows the local economy in a big way, maybe the second most pro-growth part of this tax code. So for the first time, we cut the taxes there in half. So if you spend a dollar, it's one rate. If you save it and you invest it, just cut that tax rate in half. We know that grows the economy in a big way as well. Um, and here's an example. When you get a dollar, earn a dollar, there's three things you can do with it. You can spend it, you can save it, you can invest it. So you can spend it, you can buy a donut. Apparently that's what I do with my dollars. <laughs> so, so you can buy a donut. That's good. Um, you can save it. You can put it in that local bank and they'll lend it out to that donut shop owner to buy that second glazier, that second mixer, uh, that second deep fat fire, and maybe hire another worker for that pre-dawn shift. So that's good for the economy when you save. If you invest it, maybe do it in Wall Street, maybe invest in bonds, or maybe invest it in that donut company so they can open a second location or a third, you know, or add uh, a new line of business. That's really good for the economy. And so the principle here in tax reform is encourage the savings investment to grow the economy in a big way. Uh, the other things we do on that postcard that we're proposing, you have help for families in the basics. So you have a m home mortgage deduction to encourage home ownership. You have a charitable deduction. We like charitable giving. We think it's great when people give to their local church or school or, or cause that they believe in locally. We give you help with raising kids in the child tax credit and affording col afford affordable college or a technical school. 
um, with the college tax credit. And then we have one more provision to help people get from welfare to work. And that's it. That's our postcard. It's that fair. It's that simple. And here's our point. This is not our tax code, America. This is yours. You ought to have a say in how you're taxed. So um, what we're asking America being, beginning last week is, is do you want it as fair and simple as a postcard or do you want it as complex as it is today? We can add anything onto that postcard you want. We can add dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of provisions back on there. As long as we all recognize we have to send more money to Washington and hope we get it back. And so we're going to have a conversation with American people and listen to what they want. Fair and simple is a postcard. Complex and messy is a phone book, which is what we have today. And finally, um, a fair and simpler tax code requires, demands, a fair and simpler tax collector. So we're proposing to bust up the IRS as it is today, redesign it for the 21st century. And three units is what we're thinking about. A business unit, unit staffed with experts who can quickly and accurately answer business, whether you're global tax uh, issues or local along Main Street, accurately, timely answer those questions you have, Rebecca. A second unit focused on families and individuals so that when you call and go online to ask for an accurate answer to your tax question, you ought to get it. So state-of-the-art customer service. Then the final one that I'm thinking would be a smaller unit separate from Treasury and the government really focused on resolving tax disputes. It's, I, I just get tired of hearing local families and businesses that have spent years and thousands of dollars to try to res uh, resolve a minor tax dispute. So even when they win, they've lost. And so what I'm proposing is a small claims court where families and small businesses could, if you got a tax dispute, um, you can get it resolved without hiring attorneys, without hiring accountants. We ought, to ha we ought to be thinking fresh about how that agency serves us. And so all in for growth, all in for simplicity, all in for accountability. That's where we're going, and I'll finish with this. Um, we're going to, uh, this is not an exercise. Uh, we're going to continue to listen through the rest of the year, continue to make it better at every step, uh, we intend to have a vote on this tax reform bill in 2017. And so we're serious about America wake, um, uh, weighing in. So if, look, for your constituents, uh, for, you, for you, if you want a more pro-growth tax code, speak up. If you want a fair and simple postcard, speak up. If you want no longer be tired or fear the IRS, speak up. This really is your tax code. And if we design it built for growth, listen to you carefully, I guarantee you we can get this economy back on track. So, David, that took a way longer than I expect to. I apologize about that, and I know I need to scoot to, to visit some more about tax reform. But thank you for bringing this panel together, and thank you to all of you as well. So. So thank you all. Thank you, Chairman Brady. I want to mention a couple of things um, about his comments. First, the ripple effect. Tax reform, uh, real tax reform, comprehensive tax reform is going to have a positive ripple effect in the economy. And I also want to talk about simplicity. He mentioned uh, the simplicity of a tax form. Billions of hours are spent every year complying with uh, the tax code. Uh, April 15th is not a day anyone looks forward to. I would hope that at some point in the future, April 15th is a day we worry about the cherry blossoms and not a day we worry about whether our taxes are done correctly and if we're going to get them in on time. The tax code has about 4 million words in it. The novel War and Peace, 560,000 words. I've made it through the war part of War and Peace. I haven't gotten to the second half of the book. Don't tell me how it ends. But as you can see, it's very complicated. Uh, tax code is very complicated. And we have uh, a great panel. Before Rebecca speaks, I want to introduce our other panelists. Pete Seff from the National Taxpayers Union uh, is here. He is the president, as I mentioned. He leads the nonprofit organization's government affairs, public relations, and development activities. Pete also oversees strategic planning for NTU and its staff and supervises the research and educational operations of the National Taxpayers Union Foundation. Pete has uh, been with NTU since 1988, is that correct? Wow, longer than I've been in DC. <laughs> Pete and I have known each other for 23 years. Uh, Pete is a, 
a very good friend of mine. We work on a lot of domestic and also international issues. Uh, we're part of the World Taxpayers Association where we deal with international taxation issues. And at times we get very jealous when we see other countries lowering their corporate tax rate or simplifying their, their tax code. Um, and also I have um, sort of a nickname for Pete. I call him the James Brown of the taxpayer movement. He's not a, as good a dancer, but he's the hardest working man in the city, and he doesn't really look for credit either. I mean, he sits in his office, he writes op-eds, he really is one of the hardest working people uh, in the taxpayer movement in Washington, D.C. Please visit uh, their website at ntu.org to see more of uh, what Pete is about and what uh, NTU is about. After Pete, we're gonna hear from Simon Rosenberg. He is the president and founder of the New Democrat Network, a leading center-left think tank in Washington, D.C. I told you this is gonna be bipartisan. We really wanna have a bipartisan discussion here. Simon is an experienced television news producer and highly regarded political st uh, strategist and thinker, and has spent more than 20 years in national media and politics. He is a veteran of two presidential campaigns, including a leading role in the Clinton War Room, and in his current capacity, he advises leading politicians, administration officials, and policymakers on a wide range of issues here in the United States and abroad. So Simon has done a lot of impressive things in his life. I'm gonna ask him to do one more today, is talk about how Democrats and Republicans can work together and his thoughts on um, how Democrats and Republicans can work together. As I mentioned, I've been in D.C. since 1993, and some of our the biggest, biggest successes are when we team up, when center-right people uh, team up with center-left to address issues. Whether it's corporate welfare, um, other issues, it's when we build these coalitions, that's when we have the most effective. So I'm really excited that Simon is here, uh, so he can give us a perspective that we don't often hear from a, for a perspective from the Democrats because, as I said, as we move forward, we'd really like to make this a bipartisan issue. But first, we're going to have Rebecca Bainick with a neutral posture uh, give her thoughts on tax reform. And you, know, you can count this as a therapy session because I know that uh, you have a lot of frustrations with the tax code and uh, with your business. So we'll call it a presentation slash uh, therapy session. How's that? <laughs> When uh, I first started doing this and I had the first beginning of this presentation put together, um, one of my friends who's a lobbyist here in D.C., she said, you know, it sounds kind of whiny. And I said, well, how do you not be whiny about taxes? I don't want to be a cheerleader for taxes. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Representative Brady and Representative Flores for their, their kind words and, and to be here. Today, I also want to thank Dave for, for putting this together and inviting me to, to participate with you today. Um, as a small business, tax reform is not just an abstract thought for me. It really is something that is crucial to my business. Um, you would just be astonished at what we have to do to jump through hoops to, to try and follow the code and, and to keep up with everything that's happening. Enacting meaningful ref reform will allow my company and others around the country to grow our businesses um, and to hire more employees. And isn't that the point? You know, small businesses employ over 85% of all Americans. And you always think that it's the big companies that employ all the people, but it's really the small businesses that employ all the people. We need to empower business owners, large and small, to encourage growth because we are the backbone of the economy and we can do this through the comprehensive tax reform. For the past 27 years, my company has continued to grow and expand. Uh, my mom and I actually started the company in my garage, and we've been able to really grow the company um, to not just manufacture chairs, now we manufacture office cubicles, the things that people hate to sit in. Um, but if you've been moved to any of the open plan systems, you'll be wishing you had a cubicle again because you had at least some privacy at that point. We currently employ 90 people at the factory in Texas, and then we have 55 sales reps across the U.S., Canada, Puerto Rico, and Dubai. Um, we supply some of the largest corporations in America with great quality office furniture that's actually made in America. We've been able to accomplish this in the face of an antiquated tax code that almost feels like it's opposed to our success at times. The rates that small businesses are taxed at can be as high as 44% because as Congressman Brady said, uh, my company is an S-Corp, so 
all of the income flows together, flows through to me and my mom and my sister, and we have to pay the personal tax rate on that. So when Representative Brady was talking about 25%, that sounds much better than 44%. Um, I am gonna ask him later why corporations get 20% <laughs> and we get 25. Um, so I'll have to pound on that one a little bit because I think it should be fair that small businesses don't have to pay more um, uh, or a higher percentage than, than large businesses. The, um, from a standpoint of tax rates, do you think that 44% is too high? I mean, it just sounds kind of ludicrous when you think about it, that you're asking small businesses to pay that kind of tax rate, which definitely affects how much we can reinvest back into the company. Um, small companies in general are not as well capitalized as big companies, so it does make a huge difference to us when we're thinking about the future how much are we gonna have to pay in taxes this year? We have to allocate that money and keep it on the side so that at the end of the year we can pay our taxes um, or that we pay our taxes quarterly. And so that's another thing, you know, to have to decide in April, you have to pay taxes based on what you made in the first quarter. Well, you don't really know how the year's gonna turn out. You might have had a great first quarter, but then the rest of the year isn't so great, but you've already given the money to Uncle Sam and you're not gonna get it back. You can't go back in September and say, well, I really didn't need to make that payment. Can I have it back? The first chance you're gonna have to get it back is after you file your tax return the next year. Um, so if you all have an expense account, some bigger or smaller. Meals and entertainment, this is a really crazy tax code. So if my company spends $100,000 on meals and entertainment, to take clients out, or just for my employees to travel, to go see customers. Meals and entertainment, we can only take a 50% deduction for that. So if we spend $100,000, we get a 50% deduction as an expense. The other $50,000 actually counts as income to me and my mom and my sister. So $26,000 of that $100,000 goes on my income tax as income, even though I've spent the money. I not only have spent the money, but now I have to pay tax on the money. So it's just one of the craziest things in the tax code that I'm sure there was some bad apple that was spending a lot of money here and having a lot of big parties and things like that. But it's just, you make one rule that then affects everybody else and it's just crazy for us to have to pay taxes on money that we've already spent. Additionally, the code is very convoluted for business owners and we either have to hire a team of accountants to try and avoid getting audited or dedicate countless hours trying to navigate the tax code ourselves. We can't even figure it out, so we definitely hire a team of accountants. The system is not something that fosters entrepreneurship. Because we're an S Corp, and again, so everything that happens at the company flows through to my personal return. My tax return last year was 88 pages long. And you just look at it and you're thinking, how am I gonna understand that? And then you get the letter from the accountants that say, here's your tax return, but we don't take any responsibility for what's in the tax return. So they don't sign it. My husband and I sign it. And at that point we're thinking, we hope they did it right because we don't really know what's in there and how it all flows through and, and what happens. And then about two months ago, I had to prove my income for a certification, for a government certification. And so I'm going through the tax return and I'm trying to figure out how much money I made last year. And I couldn't do it. I had to call the accountants back and they had to put together a spreadsheet <laughs> to figure out how much money was allocated to me and which deductions I got. So what was my true income at the end of the year? Now that's kind of silly that I can't even figure out what my true income is based on this crazy tax return that's 88 pages long. All, all business industries, whether they're small or large, would benefit from a, a, a better program. Uh, it's such a headache to business owners to try and figure out, you know, what's the right things to do. Um, I would like to see a, a system that I could understand, that you could understand, and that not just people who've been in the accounting business forever. And it's funny, because when we talk to our auditors, they don't know anything about tax. When we talk to our tax people, they don't know anything about the audit. So it's not even that you can just be a CPA and under this, understand this stuff. You have to specialize in tax to understand all of this. Texas is a very business friendly 
tax state. And so I think that uh, one of the reasons that there's maybe more Texans involved in this is also one of the reasons that Texas is growing so fast. You know, if you think about it, we don't tax businesses as much as other states do. We don't have a state income tax. But what happens is because we do business in all the other states, we have to figure out whether we have nexus in these other states. And so all of a sudden, we'll get a bill from a state that they're charging us taxes for product that we sold into their state, even though we don't have a presence there. So it's getting, the, the tax laws are getting so confusing because now it's not just the federal laws, it's the state laws. And so we have to have our accounting team do an audit every year, which states have changed their laws that now we could possibly have nexus in them so that we know we can allocate, again, how much more are we gonna have to save on the side to pay all of these individual state business taxes, even when we don't have um, a person or an operation location there. Um, the PATH Act, which was the, what was it for? What does it say? What does it stand for? Uh, right. So it extended, there were 20 different extenders uh, that ev just kept getting renewed every year. But they would get renewed like December 20th. <laughs> so you go the whole year wondering, well, am I going to be able to use that tax extender or am I not going to be able to use it? And you're just hoping every year at the end of the year that they would get extended again so that you didn't have to pay additional taxes over what you already thought you had to pay. So this actually put 20 of those into the permanent area, and so that was a huge help for us. Um, there's a couple of other tax codes that are things that are, that are good, like Section 179 for capital expenditures. That's very good for my company. We made a huge acquisition last year, and it really gave us the ability to go ahead and, and expense those expenses. So again, this is, you know, if you're not real familiar with how this works, it used to be if you went out and you spent $100,000 to buy a piece of equipment, you could only expense whatever, if it was 10 years you could uh, equipment, you could only expense the first year. Well, if you're a small business and you just spent $100,000 but you only get to write off $10,000, that's a problem because you spent the money but you don't get the deduction. So that's where the 179 uh, credits come in. And then another one is research and development. You know, if you think about it, innovation comes from small business. We're the ones who come up with the new ideas. Um, almost everybody in here probably sits in an ergonomic chair. So our company was the first company to ever put adjustable arms on a chair. That was 26 years ago. Now you would just, if you sat in a chair that didn't have adjustable arms on it as a task chair, you would think, what's wrong with this chair? So innovation like that comes from small businesses, and then eventually the big companies follow suit and follow along. But having that research and development tax credit is a huge issue for small businesses to be able to reinvest that money into the company and to be able to, again, expense it the first year. By the end of the day, you know, we want to be able to just unshackle the economy and release our full potential by finding comprehensive fixes to these problems. Um, let's stop pitting the large companies against the small companies. And again, we just, I told you about that. We're going to have to fix that one a little bit too. Um, moving away from small businesses and talking about big businesses, you know, big businesses are my customers. They're the ones that we sell our products to. You know, the Fortune 500, that's where the majority of my business goes, other than, of course, to the government. We, about 40% of our business is to the government. Um, but for those corporations, if they're not taxed as high, then they'll have more money at the end of the year, and maybe some of that money will be spent on employee benefits and making people more comfortable and buying better chairs and height adjustable workstations. And if anybody's looking for a good chair, I'll be over here at the end. <laughs> buy one or you can buy a thousand. We got you covered. Um, finally, I'm really excited to learn that the House Republicans have, have put this bill forward, and special thanks to, to Congressman Brady for his efforts in, in leading the charge on this. I think it is something that is gonna be a pretty dramatic help for, for all of us. It's going to help to lower tax rates for individuals, small businesses, and corporations, which is gonna encourage growth. It will fix longstanding issues like the estate tax and problems associated with corporate inversions. Um, the estate tax is a horrible threat to family-owned businesses. I mean, if, if my mother died, she's 72, very young and very healthy, but if she died, 
we would be in a catastrophic situation because first we'd have to hire an appraiser to come in and appraise our business and then her 44 percent share which would go to my dad she would have to pay taxes or he would have to pay taxes on anything that's above the limit so why do you have to pay a death tax anyway because we've already paid taxes believe me on everything that we've earned in that company has already we've already paid taxes on so the death tax to me is just you know a, a real slap in the face for people especially family-owned companies when you already have a catastrophe and then you have to turn around and figure out how you're going to pay this huge tax bill on an asset that you've already paid all your taxes on revamping the, the tax code is an important step but we do need bipartisan support and I think that that can can really happen um, business owners we can't wait another 30 years this is something that that needs to happen quickly and something that I think that if we can get through the reform is going to be a, a great asset to to our country um, you know don't get me wrong I'm, I'm not afraid of paying taxes I just would like to pay my share of taxes and when big corporations pay 20 or 40 percent we pay 44 percent but again so convoluted on how we actually get to that number and if we could just simplify things I think it would uh, be great for our country and really help us to to grow our economy thank you Thanks so much for the very gracious introduction, David. I'm going to replay that on the video for my wife. She'll never believe it. <laughs> We've focused a lot on the 1986 tax reform. There's another year and another number I'd also like to mention. The year 2001, November to be exact, when a poll was taken by McKenna Research by a 50 to 32 percent margin, the respondents said they feared getting an IRS audit notice in the mail more than they feared getting anthrax in the mail. Gallows humor, but there's a degree of truth and it speaks to the fear that people have of our tax system. Another number, 8.92 billion. Uh, Chairman Brady and David both mentioned the complexity of our tax system, the fact that it now takes 6.1 billion hours of business and individual time to comply with the federal tax code. 8.92 billion is the number of hours currently in the regulatory inventory for tax compliance. In other words, that's what's on the near-term horizon for compliance burden. It's going to increase by about a third in the next few years. Both parties need to recognize that this is a tax system about to collapse under the weight of its own complexity. And in complexity, we also have a taxpayer rights problem. These are two aspects of the system in addition to the need to encourage economic growth that ought to be driving tax reform. And yet, we are talking so much about the future today. What's going to happen in 2017? I'd like to talk about what needs to happen right now to lay the groundwork for tax reform. It's about establishing processes within Congress and the executive branch that will ensure we have bipartisan cooperation, if not consensus, to arrive at a piece of legislation that is at least acceptable, palatable, to a majority of members of Congress and a majority of folks in whoever's in the next administration. How do you do that in a Congress whose session days are dwindling down? We have a lame duck session, perhaps, after the election that might last a few weeks, a couple of days to work this month. What in the world do we do with that time? I'll offer a few suggestions, and I hope they're practical enough that you can take them back to your bosses and say, we ought to be thinking about these things right now. One of them, I think, is to focus on the administrability of the tax system. It was the ranking member of the Small Business Committee, uh, Congresswoman uh, Velasquez, who said, and I quote, this was last year, she said, in the past, small businesses have told us that complexity and uncertainty create difficulty when filing tax returns. Many business owners worry that one simple mistake can lead to a costly and time-consuming audit. 
at a time when many businesses are striving to expand every dollar, every hour counts. That's an absolutely true statement, but what can we do short of actually ripping apart the tax code and trying to rebuild it? Well, I had a meeting with the national taxpayer advocate, Nina Olson, a couple of months ago, and was reminded of the taxpayer advocate's annual report card to Congress. What she does is follow up on all the recommendations that she has made to Congress on everything from tax simplification to taxpayer rights. She came across an interesting provision in 2014 that Congress has yet to act upon. According to the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act, the Internal Revenue Service is supposed to report to Congress each year on sources of complexity and difficulty of compliance in the tax code. Unfortunately, it's only done that twice. The important part is, even though the IRS has fallen down on the job, the two times the agency did do its job, Congress acted. It resulted in a technical corrections bill, both times that made the tax system simpler and easier to comply with. We need to resurrect that process. How many folks here are on Senate Finance or House Ways and Means? Okay, I have been told by the taxpayer advocate, lodge an inquiry with the IRS, the division performing it. I can give you the contact information, and the agency will almost certainly get back on the ball and start producing these reports again. That's something that can be done without a single vote in Congress right now, and it can, again, start a long dormant process of simplifying the tax system. Another idea, I think, is to take a look at taxpayer rights issues. Now, the Senate Finance Committee has done an excellent job marking up legislation this year for taxpayer protections, taxpayer privacy rights. This uh, occurred in April, and Senate Finance has marked up a bill that could be the basis for more comprehensive taxpayer rights legislation that could pass this year. Senators Grassley, Cardin, and Thune have offered a whole package of taxpayer rights provisions that would affect small businesses, individuals, large businesses, would provide more protections in the audit process, more remedies in court, more protections for so-called innocent spouses who are being charged with tax liabilities that the other spouse actually owes. Here again, we don't need too much time on the congressional clock to get a bill like that over the finish line. Both the ranking member of Senate Finance and the chairman of Senate Finance have called upon their members to come forward with proposals that might be of a relatively non-controversial nature that could be attached into a larger package moving through Congress near the end of the year. This is a perfect candidate for it. Rebecca gave numerous instances of the fear that the tax code can engender, the lack of due process if a citizen might make an honest mistake. Those kinds of taxpayer protections are available in legislation right now. Another example, S2809 from Senator Rob Portman would establish more taxpayer protections for larger businesses caught in what has become a truly oppressive auditing cycle. The IRS has been engaging through its large business and international division in a whole new method of auditing that has resorted to extra legal tactics, things called designated summonses and the like. We won't get into the technical details, but it's very important that, again, we begin laying the foundation for a system that exerts less of an administrative burden on American business and American individuals, not just an economic growth burden. 
Another idea that appears to be gaining some bipartisan traction has to do with calling a timeout on something called the Treasury Sec Section 385 rule. Section 385 gives the Treasury powers to issue very extraordinary and complex rules affecting various parts of the taxpaying population. Well, there's a rule out now regarding these corporate inversions. It has aroused concern on both sides of the aisle. Eleven Ways and Means Committee Democrats who support action on inversions and disagree probably with Republicans on how to do that, nonetheless wrote to the Treasury Secretary and said, we have major concerns about the spillover effects of this rule on honest companies trying to manage their cash flow through debts and equities. It would be very simple for Congress to declare in a resolution, take a time out on the Treasury's rulemaking until 2017. That makes sense given the lack of time we have in this session to properly vet that rule, not only on an administrative level through the executive branch, but on a policy level in the legislative branch. It would be very easy and very important to do. I would also urge those who did not raise their hand uh, as being with a tax writing committee, and that's just about all of you, to think about the contributions that your bosses and their memberships on committees can make to tax reform. We often think of the tax writing committees as being the only ones who can really be technically involved in the process. Well, they certainly do have the expertise. Thank goodness we've got them. But you all have technical expertise in areas of the tax system where your input could be invaluable. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had the honor of being able to testify before a subcommittee of the House Small Business Committee on audit issues facing small businesses. We were able to have very technical discussions that could provide valuable input into legislation going forward. The appropriations committees, other committees can have similar effects and input into how we design our tax system and the agency administering it. And you might be asking, well, here I am, a, who, a person outside of Congress giving you advice on what should happen inside Congress. What are we going to do? What role are we going to assume? I won't speak for David, but I think I can. <laughs> we are committed to reaching across the aisle, across the ideological spectrum, to engage in an honest and productive discussion over tax reform. If you think that's crazy, I'd hearken back to uh, the year 2006, 10 years ago, when we got together in a room with Senator Wyden, along with uh, American Conservative Union, folks, Progressive Policy Institute, Citizens for Tax Justice, and we fought like cats and dogs for the better part of two weeks, but thanks to Senator Wyden's vision and that of several other Republicans as well as Democrats, we hammered out what was called the Cleanse the Code Coalition's principles for tax reform going forward. Okay, they're not incredibly detailed. They may not provide the basis for a bill, but they provided a framework for a discussion over tax reform that has been taking place amongst the advocacy group community now for the better part of a decade. We established principles such as transparency in the tax law so that businesses and individuals could better understand their liabilities, respect for the fiscal impact on revenues and expenditures of tax reform, designing a system that is structured to avoid singling out individuals or industries for punitive tax burdens, and 
designing mechanisms that will encourage consistent review and oversight of the laws. These are things that we on the outside of Congress and those of you on the inside of Congress can be working on in 2016. It's important to remember that tax reform really is the product of everyday habit, not just once in a generation grand bargains. 1986 was a pivotal year, but many months, even years of work went into that moment when the final package actually became law. And getting results on big tax reforms next year really means working on smaller details now. We can make progress on tax simplification and taxpayer rights now that will help us get to the bigger questions of redesigning the laws themselves so that they are more effective and better at encouraging economic growth in our economy. Talk to us, please. That's why we're not at the podium. We want to have a dialogue. Thank you. be here today um, there's a lot uh, a lot's been covered so let me try to I'm gonna be try to be brief so there's time for, for questions and and I do want to in the spirit of bipartisanship and sort of comedy right uh, offer some some thoughts but I, I you know we talked a little bit about what could I really do here to add value and what I want to do is um, I'm gonna spend the bulk of my time here uh, talking about what Hillary Clinton has proposed, right? Because I think this is still kind of new stuff for a lot of us. I didn't, as close as I am, and as an original Clinton person from the 92 War Room, I didn't even know some of the details of her economic plan. But before I do that, I just want to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, one is that, as was said earlier, um, you know, the Obama administration was open to corporate tax reform. They were open to repatriation, right? They were you know, we couldn't get there, um, but there were pieces of this dialogue and discussion today that were, I feel there were political opportunities that may have been missed for a variety of reasons, right? And we can get into it. But I think, first of all, there wasn't hostility uh, towards the notion of, you know, making significant and sizable changes in, in, the, in the tax code in the last, uh, over the last four years. Um, Second thing is I think that Democrats, I, I think that just on a language thing, right, for those of you trying to reach over to our, to come to our place, uh, is that, um, you know, we obviously see, there are two areas that I think we see very differently, right, from some of the discussion today. One is the distinction between reform and revenue, right? I mean, we're sort of, I don't think Democrats are gonna be excited about any tax reform or tax package that reduces the amount of revenue that comes into the government. <laughs> um, and I think that the, I think there is going to be a lot of energy coming out of this election towards doing things that makes Washington more responsive to everyday people. I think this is a sentiment that has been loudly expressed in both parties, frankly. Um, and so I do think that the simplification and reform part is an area that could become you know, easier to manage and wrestle to the ground than the reduction in revenue, because even even with dynamic scoring, right, Representative Brady's very thoughtful and serious plan, right, still dramatically increased the deficit, right? and um, you know we are, um, and so I think that working through and creating an understanding that the difference between revenue and simplicity is something that there's both opportunities and challenge there. Um, third, is that I just hope that. Republicans, when, you know, I go on Fox News all the time, right? Some of you who are Republicans may see me from time to time, and I've had some spirited conversations with some of the economic thinkers in the, Republic, in the conservative movement the Republican Party over a long period of time, but I just want to make a plea for everyone to give the Democrats a little bit more credit for being economically literate, right? Under Obama and Clinton, we've had growth, we've had lower, we've had lower deficits, uh, we've had booming stock markets, right? The last two Republican presidents, we had recessions, higher deficits, and, so, and much lower stock market growth, right? The truth is, in the last 25 years, the Democrats have dramatically outperformed the Republicans in the economic stewardship of the country when we've been in power. 
So not really interested in getting a lot of lectures from people on the conservative side about how their ideas are more economically sound because when they've been put into practice, it actually hasn't worked that way. And I think this is an area that I find to be, as somebody who's been an economically literate Democrat and somebody who's worked very hard to fashion strong economic policy, the sort of dismissal by many on the conservative side of the economic literacy of the Democrats has got to end, right? Because it's just, A, it's not true, and B, it's just there's no place to go after that. So I just want to, that was a perhaps a slightly aggressive uh, um, mo, you know, recommendation here. But let me just read to you, and I don't often do this, I'm just going to read literally from Hillary Clinton's uh, economic plan, right? Because I think these are new words and new things that we all have to, right now she's ahead in the polls, she could be the president, right? So this could actually be stuff she implements uh, starting in January. So the three main components are give working families a raise, and tax relief that helps them manage rising costs. Tax relief, right, number one. Two, create good paying jobs and get, rising, get pay rising by investing in infrastructure, clean energy, scientific and med medical research to strengthen our economy and growth, right? That's more investment, right? So that's an issue on the revenue side. Third, close corporate tax loopholes and make the most fortunate pay their fair share. You know, that's an area where we're gonna have some work to do to, to get through, right? Uh, next, and I'm just cherry picking some of the phrases. Hil Hillary understands that in order to raise incomes, we need strong growth, fair growth, and long-term growth, and she has a plan to get there. So what's interesting for the language in this event, a lot of emphasis on growth, right, f through and through this entire document. The number one recommendation she has when you actually get into the details of the plan, provide tax relief for families. Hillary will cut taxes for hardworking families to increase their take-home pay, as they face rising costs from childcare, healthcare, sending their kids to college. Clearly areas of opportunity here, right? Second, unleash small business growth. Hillary's father owned a small business, and she understands that small businesses are the backbones of jobs and growth in America. She's put forward a small business agenda to expand access to capital, provide tax relief, cut red tape, and help small businesses bring their uh, goods to new markets. You know, even Rebecca might like something like that, right, if we, uh, if we, can, if we can actually implement it. Um, and it's important to understand this is what's, this is the language, right? This is not, you know, this is what's in the public document. You can go to the website, right? Next, she talks about um, needing to fund her, po her college plan through closing uh, tax loopholes, right? Uh, corporate tax loopholes. Um, and then finally, a few more things, right? Ensure more workers share near record corporate profits. And so she talks about uh, ways of profit sharing, right? 15% tax credit for companies that share profits with workers on top of wages and pay increases. Um, but then here's the area probably of greatest disagreement, right? Where there's gonna be the struggle and the wrestle if we all come together next year. Hillary supports ending the carried interest loophole, enacting the Buffett rule that ensures no millionaire pays a lower effective tax rate than their secretary and closing tax loopholes and expenditures that benefit the wealthiest taxpayers to pay for her plan to make college affordable and refinance student debt. So if you go through this, right, lots of interest in simplification, right, I think particularly for small businesses, uh, tax reduction and cuts for middle class families, um, but where there is, I think, significant difference is going to be on, you know, lowering revenue uh, and also lowering revenue, particularly for people who are wealthy. Um, and there is no mention of corporate tax rates in here. And I think that the, my interpretation of that is that uh, despite, you know, the obvious issues of the high corporate tax rate is that that's going to, you know, she is not indicating that she's open to that, right? And this of lowering the corporate tax rate is a fair read of this document. It doesn't mean that in some kind of grand bargain, right, there isn't, you know, give and take in all this. But I think as a starting place, right, it means that, you know, there's common ground, right? It, we may not get everything we want, and I also think a lot of your recommendations about sort of process were really good, by the way, and, and about just us taking this all more seriously and recognizing, look, I'll say this, my grandmother started a business in the 1920s. It ran up until a few years ago. It was a family business. My mother worked there, my father worked there, my grandfather worked there, my grandmother worked there. I had cousins who worked there, brothers and sisters. I grew up in a small business. I know what it's like, right, to worry about making, you know, my parents, uh, they worked every weekend when I was growing up because they actually had to go to work, right, all, all the time. And I think that I agree with the sentiment in this room 
that a lot of Americans would would uh, would expect us to do more now to simplify a tax code that is is like a runaway train, right? That has gotten so big and so cumbersome that it's hard for particularly small businesses who don't have the resources of big businesses to manage the complexity of the tax code. And so I do think there's real opportunity there on the simplicity side. Um, so my basic conclusion to this is that, look, I, I think this isn't what Democrats get up every day thinking about, right? But I think that in a, in a Congress next year where we're likely to have, you know, if the likely outcomes of the elections today are that Hillary is the president and that there are more Democrats in the House than we have now and the Senate is sort of who knows what's going to happen in the Senate, it, you know, the only way to get any kind of meaningful change is going to be through a bipartisan way, give and take, right? I think what I want to argue is that there is a, a lot of a starting place here with Hillary's plan where something meaningful could happen over the next few years. And let's be optimistic about it, right? Why not? So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Simon. Um, we're going to open it up to Q&A, but I just want to mention that uh, Rep, uh, Representative uh, Kind was supposed to be here, but a last minute uh, scheduling conflict, but he really wanted to be a part of uh, this discussion. And he'll do a future event. Yes. That's, he's committed he'll do a to a future, future event. event. Yeah. So I'm going to open up the Q&A. Uh, Rebecca, you talked about how complicated this is, the, the cost of compliance, but also the excessive rate of, you know, 40, 44 percent. When we talk to folks, the, you know, man on the street interviews, people say, well, if I had more money in my pocket, I'd open up a small business. Can you explain how um, really reducing the cost of compliance and also the, the, the high rate of taxation, how that would help you expand your business? Well, to just go back to the very beginning, so the first year that we were in business, um, you know, as you spend money, you think, okay, I'm expensing things. Well, we were spending money to buy inventory, and I didn't know enough about accounting to know that inventory is an asset, and it doesn't count as an expense until you actually use it. And so we sent all the books to our accountant, and he calls the next day or a couple days later, and he says, um, okay, you need to write an $80,000 check to the IRS. <laughs> Dude, I don't have $80,000. <laughs> We've spent all the money growing the business. And he's, so then he's teaching me about accounting and that I can't count all the inventory that we have bought to make all the chairs because it's an asset that hasn't been used yet. So it's, it's things like that that when you think about it, if, if you've spent the money, it should be able to be an expense and not just that it's inventory sitting there to help grow. Um, but I, I think, again, it's just it's so confusing because I had no idea that if I spent the money, it wasn't an expense. You would just think that's just common sense. So I think that there's a lot of things that, um, that we can do that will, will show small businesses um, that it isn't quite so difficult. And it gets even more difficult when, when you're a government contractor, all the additional things that you have to do. Uh, but that's a whole different session. <laughs> now, Pete, quick question for you. Um, this is a chicken or egg question. Is would you rather see uh, comprehensive or little bits of tax reform or taxpayer rights having um, really taxpayers have more say in, um, in how the IRS uh, works? What do, what do you think, if you were to, if you were a member of Congress or the President, what do you think should be the first step? It's more a matter of timing. You know, the urgency of the corporate side, especially resolving some of these horrendous issues amidst events like large companies being hounded by uh, French and Spanish tax authorities abroad, all of those things demand urgent action. I do think that by focusing perhaps this year on some of the work that's already been done or could be done on simplification and taxpayer rights, you beget a process that will lead to exploration of some of the thornier questions on policy in 2017. Peter, I'll agree with you, but I just have one, um, you know, one caveat, is that I think if, if we address corporate tax reform as the first one, uh, the, the left may look at that and say, why? You know, let's let's talk about the complicated tax code. Let's look for, uh, you know, common ground. And Simon, this gets to a question for you: Is what are we doing wrong? What's the center right doing wrong when we when we reach out to Democrats and try to come up with uh, ideas on how to to reform taxes? 
Yeah, look, there's a, I, I just think that there's the huge divide, I think, and this is getting to very simple stuff. This is like, you know, college level economics, right? Is that we see fiscal policy as a tool of economic policy, and I think that in many ways the right sees fiscal policy as sort of almost a standalone, you know, standalone goal in of itself, right? And, um, and so, you know, when you look at Obama's economic plan, right, the fiscal issues were always fourth or fifth down, and they were part of the economic plan. There wasn't a separate tax plan. I mean, we don't see the world that way, right? And so I, I do think that where, you know, my two cents about this is, so, you know, we, we would not see reform, I think, and for the Democrats in this room, you can correct me if I'm going outside of this, we would not see reform as necessarily meaning less revenue, right? There's a reform, reform is, you know, I think there would be a lot of running room for, and Hillary says it, it's very prominent in her thing, that the tax code's too complicated, it's accrued over time, we've gotta, you know, make this thing far simpler for regular people to engage with. The issue of what happens with revenue is gonna be this other, you know, really titanic struggle, because as you know, you know, public investment is down to historically low levels, right? At a time when we have, uh, you know, enormous infrastructure needs, we have a growing population, all these other things. And so the, the, the other, so I think that there is, one is, so three quick things. One is give Democrats more credit for being economically literate and not hostile to growth and, and, and business. Second is, because there's a sort of a straw man of an old Democratic Party that hasn't existed for a very long time. I mean, Bill Clinton, was elected 24 years ago, right? And so the party that came before him has been long gone, right? Second is to disaggregate the simple and reform part from the revenue side in, in the way that you approach us. And third, though, that recognize that, you know, I, th I think Democrats are looking for things to do to be responsive to the public sensibility, this public cry for making Washington work better and be more accountable to them. I think that in some ways Republicans have a more clearly articulated agenda around that than Democrats do. And, and so I think that there is an awareness that post Bernie Sanders, post Trump, right, that there's got to be a way of going back to voters and saying we're doing things to change. And so I think, I think as I, and just to finish, is that Hillary has clearly created openings here, but there are gonna be areas of vast disagreement as well. And the question is as part of any legislative strategy, right, half a loaf, do you go for the big one, right? You know, this whole thing, right? Do you take incremental steps and take what you can get? I'm a, a believer in comprehensive immigration reform, right? We've tried to do the big immigration reform again and again and again. It hasn't worked. Should we be taking steps forward more incrementally? That's a huge area of debate on our side, right? And so I think that's gonna be an area, a strategic debate for you, but certainly what we do know is that Democrats are gonna have to deal with a bill that is thoughtful and serious and well-reasoned, where there's a lot of support on the Republican side. And that hasn't really been true, right? I mean, there hasn't been a thing that we've had to respond to. There's been, a, it's been more abstract. And I think that's also gonna potentially force action next so year. So are you saying that Republicans are from Venus and Democrats are from Mars? I think this is a well-established, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is news. I'm not breaking any news here. Well, you know, one thing I've noticed from all three comments and actually comments from the chairman is the how complicated the tax code is is this seems like pretty fertile common ground um you know simon we can have other panels where we talk about revenue and tax cuts and <laughs> the effect of tax cuts but i think uh the complicated tax code. if i'm hearing everyone correctly this seems to be a uh, pretty decent common ground do we have any um additional uh questions for the panel yes You know, there's actually an, an excellent article I was reading on this. I'll, I'll recommend it to everyone in the room. Uh, Howard Gleckman in uh, Forbes did a side-by-side -side comparison. And, and the interesting angle on the center-right, at least, is that Trump's plan actually clashes headlong on the topics of foreign earnings and taxation with the House Republican plan that was just put out. 
And I think that is as big a dividing line as you'll see in the next Congress if there were a President Trump. Um, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Any other thoughts, Simon or Rebecca? OK. Um, any more questions for the panel? No more questions? Great. Um, well, thank you for, uh, for coming today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Michi Iliazzi, uh, who works for TPA, for putting this together. Very hard. Please feel free to uh, stick around and ask us any questions uh, offline. Thank you.